The experience of our armies in Africa and Europe has emphasized the importance of rail transportation in combat areas and the importance of organizing and training railroad battalions for use overseas. All these officers and most of these enlisted men are old hands from the Pensy, the B&O, the Delaware Hudson, and the other great railroads of America. Once they put on fatigues, they start at the beginning again and learn railroading the Army way until they can strip and reassemble a locomotive under field conditions. These are government-owned train sheds and repair shops at Camp Claiborne. And after these men learn the nomenclature of the iron horse, there's a 50-mile strip of standard gauge track to practice on. In total war, railroading is a weapon, and the work of shunting and coupling freight cars is work for soldiers. Soldiers engineer the locomotives and man the switches, and the soldiers at Claiborne run a regularly scheduled train each day over the 50-mile strip between Claiborne and Camp Polk. But this is no milk train. These men are schooled to work under fire in combat areas. They furnish their own security and observation, and when they hit trouble, it's their mission to repair the damage and keep the train running. After the damage is estimated, the call for repair crews goes from the signal man to the Claiborne operator to the dispatcher, and the crews pull out. Some of them traveling overland in trucks. Some of them coming up along the rails on hand cars. Bulldozers level the bombed roadbed, and flat cars bring up new rails. A stretch of track carrying supplies can be the lifeline of an army or a campaign. Long reaches of track and slow-moving trains are vulnerable to sabotage, landmining, and aerial attack. Men trained on the Claiborne line have already done vital work under fire in establishing and maintaining supply lines on the battlefields of Africa and Europe, and in reconditioning lines destroyed by the enemy in retreat. The importance of this work increases as the Allies cut deeper into Europe and their armies move further inland from their coastal supply depots. Railroads bind together the territory we hold and push ammunition, food and equipment across yesterday's battlefields up to the expanding front. At a distance and in a bad light, convoys look pretty much alike. This is a Japanese convoy. This is seized Japanese film. Captured film helps us to piece together the character of the enemy. Japanese mess sergeants see that their soldiers are well fed. Rice and fish is no diet for an American, but it keeps the Nipponese going. The food the Japanese eat, their standard of living, and their feudal government are way behind the Western democracies. But there's nothing backward about Japan at war. These are photographs of an amphibious maneuver. These maneuvers play a large part in Japanese training. Through such training, they laid the groundwork and made the plans for the seizure of the Pacific Islands before the Allied forces could be strengthened there. And they continue to train for any time when their enemy might be found off guard. The seizure and fortification of these small islands form a vital outermost defense for the Japanese Empire. The maneuvers are covered by the guns of a still powerful navy. This practiced landing seems to be unopposed as were the landings on many of the small islands they took for themselves early in the war. The firing of a small village is primitive warfare, but the advance is covered with modern machine guns. These men may have lived in straw houses, 
but the training they have been given is comparable to the training given by the United States, England, and their allies. There's no rubber on the wheels of these guns, which probably means that these pictures were taken before they'd been able to utilize the resources of conquered Malaya. Then the tanks move in. Their infantry training is not unlike ours. They make an orderly assault using natural terrain for cover. Their weapons may be inferior, but for cunning, savagery, and obstinacy, they're hard to beat. They're smaller than we are, but they make the toughest and most brutal enemy in modern warfare. They're not burning many houses these days, or carrying their flag through the streets of newly captured outposts. The flags of the United Nations are driving them in another direction. In 1940, the people of Holland could celebrate a hundred years of peace. Germany had promised to respect the neutrality of a country famous for her canals, her tulips, her clean cities, and her peace-loving people. This nation of nine million had produced nine Nobel Prize winners. Through the successful and peaceful management of their own country, the standard of living in Holland was raised until the Dutch death rate from natural causes was the lowest in the world. On the morning of May 10th, 1940, the Germans broke their treaty and the Dutch began to die from unnatural causes. The Dutch learned about modern warfare when all that was left of Rotterdam was smoking walls and open graves. The heart of their small country had been destroyed. The heart of the Dutch Empire, established by Dutch sailors and traders hundreds of years ago, reaching deep into the Pacific and Indian Oceans, an empire that was managed peacefully and profitably for both the colonizers and the natives. Education was encouraged. The peaceable natives retained their traditions, observing their ancient dances and customs until the Japanese, allies of the enemy that had destroyed Rotterdam and occupied Holland, attacked the outpost of the Netherlands Empire, swarming over the beaches and boundaries, overwhelming the native troops in the early days of Japanese surprise warfare. The government of the Dutch Empire escaped to London to carry on the war in exile under the leadership of Queen Wilhelmina. Other Dutchmen who had escaped made their way to Canada and began to study the weapons that would enable them to return home. While their countrymen who were unable to escape from occupied Holland carried on the dangerous underground work of sabotage, these soldiers hardened and drilled themselves for the day when they could fight their way back. And in the United States at an airfield in Mississippi, Dutch flyers from all over the world train in T-40s to avenge the crime of Holland. This is a father and his son, separated up until now by the fortunes of war. Men from Suriname and Guyana, from Java and Curaçao and Amsterdam. Men whose planes were shot from underneath them in the battles of the Malay Peninsula. Holland declared war on Japan immediately after Pearl Harbor. And these men destroyed one Japanese ship a day until their planes gave out. We came to the United States for training and equipment. And in the near future, we expect to be able to take an active part in the heroic struggle of the United Nations for the liberation of Europe and Asia. The Dutch are putting their training to use. These men are fighting. One of their missions is to patrol the vital sea lanes in the hunt for U-boats. Seafaring Dutchmen, the descendants of sailors who once ruled the seas of the world, patrol the coastal waters of the colony. After fighting an heroic and losing battle off the coasts of Java, they continue to fight wherever the Allied High Command directs. Dutch anti-aircraft guns are bringing down a mounting toll of German planes. Dutch ships with Dutch crews carried American soldiers into the South Pacific. 
There were Dutch ships and Dutchmen at the landings in Africa and Sicily. And at the training camps in the United States, they continue to observe the customs of their homes. You take off your shoes to eat a rice topple. Eating this dish takes skill and practice. And the ceremony reminds these Japanese flyers of their homes in Japanese-occupied Java. The ceremonial dances are the same. But the place is a Mississippi Recreation Hall, and not an island in the east. These are the people of the Netherlands, members of a democratic commonwealth of nations, fighting and learning to fight. A peaceable people whose only road home lies across a battlefield. 